morning, everybody. Good morning. Good to see you here today. A warm welcome to you. I hope the Lord, pray the Lord will bless us as we come to worship Him. So it's good to see you here. Uh, a warm welcome to you. The uh, announcements are few. Um, I hope that you picked up one of these sheets on the way in for uh, announcing our Back to Church weekend. That'll be the 1st to the 3rd of September. You'll see that we're planning to have a barbecue um, on Friday the 1st of September. There's no charge for that, but we'd appreciate if you'd write a family name in the, uh, on the sheet and the vestibule with the numbers coming. Um, that will give us a, a good idea uh, about that. And then there's a special announcement for Saturday Night Live and anybody in, from year eight upwards. Uh, the information is there with regards to that. And then the Sunday the 3rd of September will be the recommencement of Sunday School. And we're having a special event, a uh, contemporary praise called We Worship on the first Sunday night in September and the information is there on that sheet as well. So I hope that you'll uh, come along to that. Been having a, a little chat about a congregational committee meeting at the moment. I've penciled in uh, Tuesday the 12th of September. So if that's a good idea or a bad idea, you can let me know. That's not a definite date, but just to see what the feeling is with regards to that. Um, we're starting to have clashes. I thought about having it on another date, and then I thought, no, that's presently. I have to go to that, so there's all sorts of things, but we'll see how we are uh, with that. Those are all of the announcements for today. Um, just simply also to say that we extend our sympathy today to Kim Roddy following the death of her mother-in-law. Uh, Jean Keeley. And so we extend sympathy to Kim, her husband Stephen, and the rest of the Keeley and Roddy family circle today. Those are our, our announcements. We're going to commence our worship to God by sing, singing, Come, Christians, join to sing. So let us stand and worship God.
Let us come to God in prayer. Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, we gather to come and sing songs of worship and praise to our God. We thank you that you have made yourself known and given us plenty of reasons to write hymns and songs of praise down through generations as we lift our voices to worship the God of heaven. We praise you, our Father, that you have made yourself known. We thank you, our Father, that we have the privilege of knowing an invitation to come into your presence and to worship you through Jesus Christ, our Lord. We thank you, our Father, that today we find complete access to you and peace with you through Jesus and the forgiveness of the salvation that he brings. We praise you for these great we thank you that you're a God who is independent. There is no need for us or anything else in all of creation. You are the Lord God Almighty, the maker of heaven and earth, who does not live in temples made by man, nor is he served by human hands as though he needed anything, since he gives all to mankind and breath and everything. Our Father, we thank you that we serve a God who does not lead us, but who has called us to be his people. We praise you for this privilege. We praise you, our Father, that you're a God who is unchangeable, immutable. You are unchanging in your beings and perfections and purposes and promises. Your word stands. We thank you, Father, that your attitudes do not change depending on what day it is. You can always be trusted because you always keep your word. You're never someone who fires people off just because you're moody like we are or lose our tempers and fly off the handle. We thank you, our Father, that you are unchanging. And so even as we struggle sometimes with the ways in which we sin, we thank you that we know there's some we can come to. And through Jesus be forgiven. We thank you, Father, that you are the eternal God no beginning or end, that you are not bound by time or events or acts in this world. You stand, our Father, from everlasting to everlasting. You are God. And so we thank you, our Father, that whenever we consider the promises that you make, we know that there's no best by date. We thank you, Father, that we can know peace and rest and comfort in the busyness of this life. Because through all the times of life, you are our God. Well, we thank you, Father, too, that you're a God who is ever-present. A God who is not confined by human borders, who is not restricted in any way. And so we thank you this morning that on the Lord's Day, as we come to worship you, our Father, we come before you, whether we're meeting in small groups, or in large churches, or in medium-sized churches, or just as family servants. We thank you, Father, that you're present with your people. We thank you that we don't have to invite you here, because you're already here. We would never feel lonely, Father, because you are where we are. We could never feel, Father, that you've turned your back on us, because you're present. Our Father. We pray that you would forgive us our sin. All the sins that we know of. Forgive us the sins that we're not even aware that we have done wrong because of our lack of awareness. Forgive us for the sins of our thoughts, words and deeds. Known to an ever-present, all-powerful, immutable, independent God. And as we worship you today, our Father, we may we pray that we may see the privilege that we have of not only singing nice hymns and songs, but the truths contained within them that reveal to us who you are and how you can be known. And the privilege that we have in Jesus today to come before you. We pray that you'd bless us in our time together. We pray that you'd meet with us and minister to us where we are. We ask that you'd be with us today, whether we're present in this service whether we're watching it online. 
you for us not. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. We come to our Bible reading, which is from First Corinthians, Second Corinthians, chapter three and verses seven to eighteen. Second Corinthians, chapter three, verses seven to eighteen. And uh, you'll find it on page 1159 of the Bible of the Pew. 2 Corinthians chapter 3, reading from verse 7. Now if the ministry that brought death, which was engraved in letters on stone, came with glory, so that the Israelites could not look steadily on the face of Moses because of its glory, fading though it was, Will not the ministry of the Spirit be even more glorious? If the ministry that condemns men is glorious, how much more is the ministry that brings righteousness? <coughs> For what was glorious has no glory now in comparison with the surpassing glory. And if what is fading came away, beg your pardon, and if what was fading away came with glory, how much greater is the glory of that which lasts. Therefore, since we have such a hope, we are very bold. We are not like Moses, who would put a veil over his face to keep the Israelites from gazing at it while the radiance was fading away. But their minds were made dull, for to this day, the same veil remains when the old covenant is read. It has not been removed because only in Christ is it taken away. Even to this day, when Moses is read, a veil covers their hearts. But whenever anyone turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. <coughs> now, the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. And we, who with unveiled faces all reflect the Lord's glory, are being transformed into his likeness with ever increasing glory, which comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. May the Lord bless to us this reading of his own word. It's good to see some boys and girls here this morning. If you'd like to come and meet me at the front, that would be super. <coughs> I did see you. Hello, DJ. Hello, Rosie. Come on. Is that us? It is? Okay. There's a couple of others who are very shy, so that was good. That's why I'm accounting to this morning. How you doing? Good to see you. I'm glad you're here. There's not as many as there was last week, is there? But it's good to see you here. I'm going to uh, tell you a, a story about uh, Moses meeting with God, and he heard from God the rules that were to live by for life. And it gives us an idea into what's important with God and what's very special. And so that was really good. And so we see, hiya, and so we see a couple of very important things. I'm sure you've heard of the Ten Commandments, have you? Heard of the Ten Rules, Ten Commandments? Well, they're very special. Hiya, come on in. You're very welcome. Good to have you here. Now, uh, there's ten rules that God gave. The people of God, people of God were out walking through Egypt, uh, through the, the desert, and they were told by God, I want to meet with you. I want to tell you what's really important, the ten rules that I want us to live by. And so he said to Moses, come here, I want to talk to you. And Moses went and met with God. And he says, I'm going to come and meet with the people. I want you to make sure they're all washed, all clean, all ready to meet with me. Because I'm going to come down onto the top of a mountain. And I'm going to meet with the people there. And that's what happened. The people all got ready so that they could meet with God and hear what God had to say. And then the Lord appeared at the top of a mountain. And it happened whenever there was thunder and lightning and a big a uh, cloud came round the mountain so nobody could see God but they knew he was there and the people were terrified Moses went to meet with God and God gave him the ten commandments and I'm going to run through with those the kinds of things that God expects us to do 
The problem is that we fall short of these so often. We need the forgiveness of Jesus. But it gives us a good steer in the direction that we should go. Rule number one that God gave is that God is to be first in your life. He is to be first. There is one God and he is to be first above all. He's more important than anyone else and that's why we come and we worship him. He also says that we're not to worship any other gods. That's rule number two. Don't worship anybody else or anything that's made. Do you know in the parts of the world there are some people who worship the different planets and trees and rivers? But we're not to worship anything or anyone else. We're just to promise to worship God. We're to make sure we don't use God's name with disrespect. Sometimes whenever people are talking about God, they just slip his name in here, there and everywhere else. And they don't talk about him with reverence. We're not to do that. We're not to mock him or swear by his name. Then also we're to keep the Sabbath day as a day of rest. But it's not just a day where we sleep. It's a day where we come and do something different. And we come to worship God. And then you can go home after your dinner and you can have a sleep then. But make sure that you come to worship God first. Because it's a day of rest, a day that's different to all the other days that are there. Rule number five is honour your mummy and your daddy. If your mummy or your daddy tell you something, you know what? You're supposed to do it. That's one of the things we're to do. We're supposed to do it. We're to honour our mums and our dads. Rule number six is don't murder anybody. It's bad to murder people. And later on, Jesus would say, you know, it's wrong even to hate people in your heart because you've kind of murdered them there too. And that was another rule that we're to have. Rule number seven is that you're to be faithful to the person you're married to. If you're married, your husband or a wife, you're not to be chasing anybody else. If you watch the news and the television, sometimes you think that's all that goes on. But we're to honour marriage. You're not supposed to steal. You're not to, supposed to steal. You're supposed to respect other people's property. That's rule number eight. Make sure that you don't go around taking things that aren't yours. If you're in school or nursery and you see a rubber that's somebody else's, and you think, oh, that's a really nice rubber. You don't lift it. If you want to borrow it, you ask them, and then you leave it back. You don't steal. Don't tell lies. That's rule number nine. Don't tell lies. It's really bad. God tells us he's a God of truth. And so whenever we're talking to people, to our friends, or to our mums and dads, or granny and grandmas, and uncles and aunties, we're to make sure that we tell the truth. Make sure that we always say what's true. And rule number 10 is don't be envious of what other people have. Sometimes people go around the, the, their, their day saying, oh, I wish I had that toy. Or I wish I had that pencil. Or I wish I had this. Or I wish I had that. We're well, not to be envious of what other people have. We're to be content with what we have. And be so grateful for what we have. Jesus later on talked about the 10 rules. And you know what he said? This, they can be summed up in two things. One is to love the Lord your God with all your heart, your soul and mind. And the other one is to love your neighbour as yourself. So those are the ten rules that God gave Moses. Do you know what the problem was? Whenever we read the story of Moses passing on those rules, the people that he told about it, they all broke them. And then they realised we can't keep this by ourselves. God gave the rules so that we have an idea of how to live. But then he sent us Jesus, who can forgive us for all the wrong times, all the times whenever we had broken those rules. So I hope you'll remember the ten rules on how we're to live. But whenever we fall short, we ask Jesus for his help. Well, let you go back to your seats now. Thanks for coming down with me. I'm glad you're here. All right. Super duper. You go back to your seats and we're going to all stand together and sing faith as small as a mustard seed.
music group are going to lead us in worship with a peace he will hold me fast.
beautiful song, fantastic words. We're going to continue to worship God with our offering. Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for the way in which we can worship you this morning by presenting to you our offerings. We present to you, Father, offerings that signify our gratefulness to you for all that you have done, for how you have blessed us, sustained us, and kept us. And as a token of our thanks, we present these offerings, praying that you take them and use them to your glory. We thank you, our Father that frail people as we are, all we need is faith as small as a mustard seed that can hold on to Christ. And we find amazingly that you hold on to us. And today, our Father, we pray that you'd minister to those who are gathered here and feel very wobbly on their feet or in their faith. And we pray, Lord, that you would grasp them. We pray that you would enable them to know what it is to have faith sustained in Christ. And we pray, Father, that they would know and experience this day you keeping your promise to hold them fast. Without you, Father, all we are left with is our trouble. With you, we have hope. We have access to you. We have the privilege of knowing your peace and your presence. And so we pray, our Father, that you would enable us in these days to be strengthened in our faith and to have praise in our hearts as we count the blessings that you pour out upon us. You remember those who mourn in these days. We pray for Kim and Stephen Roddy and we pray for the rest of the Keely and Roddy family circle following the death of Jean Keely. We pray that you'd be with them and that they would find peace and comfort in Christ. We pray, Father, for all those who mourn, for those who have concerns about their health, concerned about the future. Father, sometimes things that play our thoughts, even though we try to be strong, whatever the concerns of our hearts this day, we pray that you'd draw near. And by your spirit, we pray that you would enable us to know the gracious presence of the one who promised that his burden was light. We pray that you'd meet with us where we are and strengthen us today. Our Father, every time we turn on the news, there seems to be more significant news about the data breach and breaches within the PSNI. We pray, Lord, for those who serve on the police force. We pray, Lord, you'd watch over them and protect them. We pray for those who play support roles for the civilian uh, workers who work in the backroom staff. We pray that you'd be with them. We pray, Father, that those who would plan evil would find their plans thwarted. And we pray that those who are very worried and scared in these days would start to find that you would be their refuge and their strength. And we do pray, Lord, that those with the intent of causing harm or worry would be prevent prevented from doing so. Our Father, the most important place to have our name written is in the Lamb's Book of Life. 
And if our name is in the Lamb's Book of Life, then we pray that you'd watch over your people and bless them in the way to heaven. We think today of Christians around the world who are not able to meet in such a nice building and in such a quiet place. Some meet in small secret churches. Some meet just as family circles. Some meet our Father uh, with small churches that people wonder whether they'll be allowed to stay open any longer because of what they might say. We think of Christians in Russia, Father, who are really under the pressure to say the right thing about the government because you want to speak for Christ. Bless them, we pray. Watch over Christians in Russia who are seeking to show the love of God to others that they meet. We think of believers who are meeting in Ukraine today. We pray, Lord, you'd draw near them and bless them and be with them. We pray that you would strengthen them and encourage them to remain faithful in Christ. We think of other believers in Africa who are afraid that whenever they turn up to church on a Sunday morning that there will be Islamist uh, terrorists who will turn up and kill them again. Father, we pray that you would help your people be strong and courageous. Come to believe, come to worship together and believe that you will be in their midst, that the God of heaven will watch over them. Our Father, we thank you so much that we can turn to you, whether our days are good or bad, whether we feel that we're full of energy or whether we've come to the end of our tether. We thank you, Father, we can come to you either with thankfulness or with pleas for mercy and grace and strength. In accordance with our need, may your spirit minister to us. May we know your nearness today. Hear our prayers. We ask in Jesus' name. Crown him with many crowns is our next praise. We'll stand together and worship.
Now, if you'd open your Bibles and turn to Exodus chapter 34, you'll find it on page 94 of the Bible in the pew. Exodus chapter 34. And uh, you'll find it on page 94 of the Bible in the pew. Um, I thought I'd restart 2 Corinthians. And all through the week, I've been thinking about how many ways there are to skin a cat. How do you try and uh, get through this passage? What does it mean? And so on. And I think there's no way really to look at 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verses uh, 7 to 18, without first of all looking at the Old Testament passage that it refers to. And that's what we're going to do. And we're going to read from verse 29 to 35. Exodus chapter 34, verses 29 to 35. <coughs> So what has happened is that after breaking the first set of Ten Commandments, literally smashing them, uh, the Lord has brought Moses back, giving him the same uh, commandments, and now he comes down with that second set to find the people not worshipping a golden calf, but now ready to receive these words. When Moses came down from the Mount of Sinai with the two tablets of the testimony in his hands, he was not aware that his face was radiant because he had spoken with the Lord. When Aaron and all the Israelites saw Moses, his face was radiant and they were afraid to come near him. But Moses called to them. So Aaron and all the leaders of the community came back to him. They thought as he run away and he spoke to them. Afterwards, all the Israelites came near him, and he gave them all the commands that the Lord had given him on Mount Sinai. When Moses finished speaking to them, he put a veil over his face. But whenever he entered the Lord's presence to speak with him, he removed the veil until he came out. And when he came out and told the Israelites what he had been commanded, they saw that his face was radiant. Then Moses would put the veil back over his face until he went in to speak with the Lord. May the Lord bless to us this reading of his own word. In the dark, one light bulb is important. In the dark, one light bulb is very significant. It can show you the way home. It can light the area around it. That's really good. But imagine that one light bulb then being contrasted with the stadium lights in a football stadium. You see the difference? A light bulb is important. It shows light. It gives some glory where that is. But in comparison to stadium floodlights, that one light bulb becomes completely overwhelmed. And that's really what happens whenever we come to 2 Corinthians. In Corinthians, we see the gospel of Jesus Christ that's something far greater than anything that has gone before. But sometimes don't understand what we have in the gospel. We have to look back and see what it fulfills and what it contrasts with. <coughs> and that's an interesting thing that Paul does. He comes and shows us the difference between the law giving at Sinai and the gospel of Christ. The gospel of Christ is something mind-blowingly <coughs> superior because the gospel makes changes in people. It makes changes permanently. It changes our standing before God. It changes our relationship with him. It gives them peace with God and access to God guaranteed unconditionally forever. And all of this is through faith in Jesus Christ. Not what we have to do, but who we believe in and what Christ has achieved. And Paul in 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 7 to 18, is defending his ministry to show the ministry that he has of proclaiming Christ is greater than just sticking to the Old Testament. Now the Old Testament is needed because we need to be able to use the Old Testament to identify the Messiah who would come and all that he would do and the greatness, surpassing greatness that he would have. And Paul does that. He says this is a new covenant, a new ministry. Instead of talking about letters being engraved of stone, he now talks about the Spirit writing God's word on human hearts. Instead of talking about the fading glory that shone from Moses' face, 
he now talks about the ever-increasing glory that's reflected in the new covenant. But first, to understand what all is happening here in 2 Corinthians chapter 3, we really need to take a little skim through Exodus 32 to 34 and give you an account of understanding the amazing fulfillment that there is in Christ. Twice from Exodus 24, Israel had promised to keep all of God's laws and they had broken those promises. It is amazing by the time we get to 34 how many times the people had turned their back on God and indeed, even as Moses was receiving the Ten Commandments and how the people were to live for God, we find the first time that they are actually worshipping a man-made golden calf. They had fallen greatly. And so angry was Moses that whenever he comes down, he smashes the uh, Ten Commandments because he says to the people, you are not worth this. Israel's sin was so dreadful that they deserve complete annihilation and it was only averted because of Moses' prayers and we read of that in Exodus 32. Breaking the covenant was not without consequences though and God moves the tabernacle, the tent of his presence with the people outside the camp and what he said by that kind of picture is that you're on your own without me, without God, without hope in the world. Moses prays that God's presence would go with him and be with the people and God hears his prayer and eventually allows Moses to see the glory of God after it has passed by. He allows in chapter 33 Moses to see the afterglow of the presence of God and even that is so, so great. And he prays in chapter 34, verse 9, Not a found favour in your sight, O Lord. Please let the Lord go in the midst of us. Don't abandon your people. Don't let them be. Moses' request for the Lord's presence among his people were granted. And Moses himself became the mediator of God's presence and glory to the Israel. He was a mediator because he brought the message and he showed the glory of God by his face actually. The unveiled face of Moses indicated God's holy presence and consuming judgment and the people were terrified to the extent that Moses had to veil his face after he had finished passing on the comments. What we're going to do is we're going to little, take a little run through Exodus chapter 34 as we look at four things. The way in which we see truths about God, about the mediator, about ourselves as his church and about the gospel. And the gospel will really bring us to 2 Corinthians chapter 3 as we run through that. So four things. We're going to look at the Old Testament. We're going to see how its surpassing greatness is seen in the new. First of all, the glory of God. We see the glory of God. It's an amazing thing to see Moses' face shine. Why? Because he had seen the glory of God. This is not a shining as an embarrassed, you know, where somebody's face is beaming. This is reflecting the glory of God to the extent that the people, whenever they saw this glow, were afraid and ran away. He had been allowed to see the afterglow, if you like, of the Lord passing by. He couldn't look directly on God, but he saw his back. That's the picture that we're given. The light of God's gracious compassion and faithful love shone from Moses' face after being allowed to see the people. And you'll see in uh, chapter 34, verse 30, that Aaron and the disciples of the Israelites uh, really were so afraid of him. They didn't want to look at his face because it revealed the glory of God and in the sight of his face shining, they felt their own sin. This was a face that had met with God, had seen the afterglow of God's glory passing by, and the people were in shock and awe. They were afraid to see uh, Moses because
does it reveal the glory of God? What does this tell us about the glory of God? It tells us that God is holy and righteous and just. It tells us that he is all-knowing, all-seeing, all-powerful. It tells us that even the reflection of the glory of God is so hard for the hearts of sinners to bear. In the face of Moses, there was not even a millionth of the part of God's <coughs> true glory, and yet that was enough to make the people run in terror from Moses. What do we see here? One commentator says this. What was the people? What were the people afraid of? He says, because of the very glory that shone from his face, it searched their hearts and consciences, being what they were, sinners, and enable themselves to meet even the smallest requirements of the covenant which had now been inaugurated. The glory which they thus beheld upon the face of Moses was the expression to them of the holiness of God. And they were therefore afraid because they knew that in their inmost souls that they could not stand before him from whom the presence of Moses had come. So here's Moses presenting Ten Commandments, the people realizing that they couldn't keep those commandments themselves, and realizing that the one who had written those commandments was the glorious God, and that glory was reflected in Moses' face. The question then is, how could simple people ever meet such a glorious God in peace? So the first thing we have to think about there is the glory of God. The second thing we think about is the glory of God's mediator. Because God himself speaks to the people through a mediator, and that is through Moses. God's divine majesty has already been displayed a number of times in great brightness. He speaks to Moses from the burning bush. He shows himself through signs and wonders performed in Egypt so the people would be able to leave. He reveals himself in the fire and smoke on the mountain. And now at the end of chapter 34 he also reveals himself in a new way as he makes Moses' face shine having allowed him to see a remnant of the glory of God. These verses that we have here in verses 29 to uh, 35 don't simply tell us what happened to Moses on the mountain but also what happened subsequently afterwards as Moses repeatedly went into God's presence and every time he came back face to face he had to eventually veil his face because he was reflecting the glory of God he radiated God's glory reflecting from himself once he is back in the, in the camp, Moses had to put the veil back on, but only after he had given the message from God. He spoke with unveiled face. It was God's way of authenticating the word that he had brought. God gave Moses glory so that the people would listen to all that God had to say. Do we have a mediator today between us and God? We do. We have in the have it in Jesus Christ. He is the mediator who fulfills the rule and surpasses the rule that Moses has. The mediator who stands between us and God for our salvation. How did God authenticate the ministry of Jesus Christ? He did it through the life and ministry of Jesus, through the signs and wonders that he did. He shows the glory of Jesus Christ though. Not by a reflection of the glory of God, like Moses was, but rather because Jesus had that innate glory built in. He surpasses the glory of Moses because it is his own radiance that shines. Hebrews chapter 1 verse 3, the Son is the radiance of the Father's glory. We catch a glimpse of this glory as well at the transfiguration where Jesus went up onto a mountain and he was transfigured and his face shone like the sun and his clothes became white as light. It's no wonder that God says, this is my son, I love him, and with him I am well pleased. Listen to him. And then Jesus also prays about his glory 
been shown fully after the resurrection. He prayed in John 17, glorify me in the presence for the glory, in your presence for the glory that I had before you the world, before the world began. He has promised a resurrected body. He has promised to be sat at the right hand of God. And today the glory of Christ, of God's mediator, Jesus Christ, is seen through the great salvation that he has won. When we believe that Jesus was raised from the dead, we see the glory of the mediator, Jesus Christ. And we read in 2 Corinthians 4, 6, God has made his light shine in our hearts to give us the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Christ. First thing we see from Exodus 34 is the glory of God. The second thing we're able to see as we move from the Old Testament to the New is the glory of Christ's mediator and how Christ brings something better and bigger. The third thing we see is the glory of God's people. Moses was a sinner, and yet whenever he met with God, he also then received God's glory. He was able to reflect that glory. And King David says in Psalm 34, those who look on him, that's God, are radiant. Their faces are never covered with shame. The glory that Moses had came from looking at God. That's important for you and me to realize. Moses' face was changed. His countenance was changed because he was looking at God. He hadn't been looking at himself at all. He wasn't really even aware that his face had changed. But having been looked at God, he was then starting to be transformed. Moses became glorious by taking his eyes off himself and looking to the God of heaven. When he did this, he started to become a different person. And that's a very profound spiritual lesson for you and me. We do not glorify God by looking at ourselves and just looking inwardly all the time. Trying to judge our, how well we're doing by how comfortable we are with ourselves or how uh, confirming people are towards us. No, we find that we are changed by looking at him, by lifting our eyes from ourselves and looking to see what God says and in our position looking to Christ. We look to Christ and we are transformed whenever we lift our eyes from ourselves to him. How was Moses changed? He was changed because he spent time with God. He went to, into his presence frequently. And that's how you and I are going to be changed. To become more the people that God wants us to be. To have our batteries recharged. To start to shine out to others who we are. The disciples, ordinary common men, were able to show that they had been with Jesus because it permeated who they were. And so it's the same with you and me. We start to glorify his name. We start to show who we have spent time with. And so, friends, we do need to come and worship God. We do need to read our Bible. We do need to say our prayers. We do need to come before God and allow him to change us with the light and peace of his presence. Are you shining bright for Jesus? Do you radiate his love and compassion and grace? Don't neglect your time in prayer and Bible study and worship. But come before him and be transformed. And so in Exodus 34, we see the glory of God. We see the glory of God's mediator. We see the glory that there is for God's people. And finally, we see the glory of the gospel. And that's what really brings us back to 2 Corinthians chapter 3. There's a glory of the gospel because while there is a glory with Moses his face shone while there's a glory with finding out about what God's will is while there's a glory about allowing us to see the great God the maker of heaven and earth there is something greater than even Moses's revelation and that is the revelation of the gospel of Jesus Christ 
It's a gospel that transpires to be far greater and better than anything that had gone before. There's a comparison in 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 7 to 18. Comparison between the law of Moses and the gospel of Jesus Christ. They have their own glory. But one is like a light bulb and the other one's like a football stadium uh, lightning. And the Israelites could see that Moses' face was shining brightly. But it started to fade. That eventually would stop altogether. But what the glory that there is in the gospel of Jesus Christ in verses 7 to 8 is true and permanent. Verses 7 to 8 revealed to us that there was the uh, words from God that brought death and grave letters on a stone. And that had its own glory and Moses had its own glory. But compare that to the spirit uh, that comes with the gospel of Jesus Christ. That glory will be so much greater. The glory of God's gospel. How much glorious is that gospel? Because there is a permanence to it. And it's not only a permanence to it, it's the way in which it works. It is not simply words written on stone, but now words written on the hearts of men and women. The crucifixion and resurrection of Jesus Christ brings new life. The Spirit of God comes and writes in our hearts. It changes us from the inside out. They're not just laws that are written on a wall to be posted up and read. It is about the Holy Spirit doing glorious and transforming things in the lives and minds and hearts of God's people. This gospel also brings righteousness rather than condemnation. You read of that in verse 9. This is a ministry that brings righteousness. Everyone who believes in the atoning death and obedient life of Jesus Christ is changed. <clears throat> Those who put their trust in Jesus find the righteousness that they have been missing. The great exchange takes place. You trust in Jesus, he takes our sins and gives us his righteousness so that whenever we stand before God we are not condemned in our sin but seen as righteous, belonging to Christ. Not only is this righteousness perfect, but it's permanent. It's not something that fades. It's not something that goes away. It's our new standing before God. We're not perfect people yet, but our standing before God is complete. And not only do we have peace with God, but we have then direct access to him. That's so different of the people in Moses' day. The Israelites had a relationship with God, but only at a distance. They were told to stay off God's holy mountain. They were told to stay out of God's tabernacle and the holy of holies. They were told to uh, look away from uh, God's radiant prophet. All of their sin, there was a barrier to them fully understanding and being able to come into the presence of God and his holiness. The Israelites had to go through Moses in order to be able to come to God. But we are in a better position. Because the gospel of Jesus Christ is about us coming to Christ, who is God. And therefore, we don't have to stay off the holy mountain or stay out of the holy of holies and stay at a distance from God. We're invited to come to God, into the presence of God. And therefore, we read the words of 2 Corinthians chapter 3 and verses 12 to 13. Therefore, since we have such a hope, we are very bold. We are not like Moses who put a veil over his face to keep the Israelites from gazing at it for a while. The radiance was fading away. You see, whenever we see Jesus, we see a glory that is more direct and more immediate and more uh, fully. The access that we have is something that Moses' people could never dream of. To know God, to be able to meet with him, there is no veil between us 
we're able to see the fullness of who God is. Verse 14, if we stay in the Old Testament, we read, but their minds are made dull, for to this day the same veil remains when the Old Covenant is read, has not been removed, because only in Christ is it taken away. Even to this day, when Moses is read, a veil covers our hearts. Paul tells us that if we stay in the Old Testament, we're still veiled from the glory of God completely. If we stay in the Old Testament, we are missing the salvation of Jesus Christ, the salvation to which all the sacrifices in the Old Testament pointed to. If we stay in the Old Testament, we see things that are passing, not the permanent glory and presence of God revealed. So many Jews today sadly hear the gospel and don't respond to it. The veil, if you like, remains over them. But where salvation comes, where the veil is taken away and we see Jesus, we see the glory of a gospel message that is something extraordinary. You see that in verse 14? But their minds are made dull, for to this day the same veil remains when the Old Testament covenant is read. It has not been removed, because only in Christ is it taken away. Those words and the manner of those words are very significant. We can't take the veil away ourselves. It's not our decision to remove that veil to see Jesus. It is something that's done to us. The veil is taken away. And so we can look to Christ and see him and see all that is given to us. And that transformation that comes is something expressing the fullness and the permanence of God. And that brings us to verses 17 and 18. Now the Lord is a spirit, and where the spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. And, where, and we who with unveiled faces all reflect as God's glory, are being transformed into his likeness with ever increasing glory, which comes from the Lord, who is spirit. No more reflection, but we are able to see Christ. No more temporary, now we can see what is permanently glorifying of God and the salvation that he brings. We can see our own lives being transformed into ever increasing glory. One of the amazing things is the privilege of a minister to go into people in their final hours and see a Christian who is trusting in Jesus Christ and seeing that peace of God and the understanding of the presence of God to see them through their final hours. That's a real privilege. We see how much more we have in the gospel of Jesus Christ who transforms his people and makes them more glorious. We've taken a scan through the Old Testament into the New. We've seen how the New Testament, the New Covenant, surpasses everything in the Old. And the privilege we have today of knowing Christ knowing that whenever we are in him we're coming directly into the presence of God what a privilege may we know that through Christ in our own lives today so much so we come to our final praise then Christ our hope in life and death these are lovely words it's a lovely hymn but it reminds us of the greatness of the gospel of what we Christ our hope in life and death. Let's stand together and worship God. <laughs>
the glory of the gospel of Jesus Christ that enables us to know peace with God and to have access to him and then to know his transforming power, transforming us into his likeness with ever increasing glory. And may we know the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, the fellowship of the Holy Spirit, now and forevermore.